Another reason to doubt the authenticity of verses 9 through 20 is that they contradict Mark's original gospel. Where the original has the tomb empty, with no appearance by Jesus and the women telling no one about it, the resurrection accounts added to Mark show the women telling the disciples about the empty tomb, with Jesus appearing to the women and to various people at various times. Also, verses 9 through 20, or the long ending as it's called, radically break the train of thought at verse 8. Verse 9 begins more like a completely new chapter rather than a continuation of verse 8. Another clue that these verses, as well as the other endings, were never part of the original Gospel of Mark is that the writing style of the long ending isn't the same as what is found throughout the rest of Mark's Gospel. Here are some words found in verses 9 through 20 that are found nowhere else in the Gospel of Mark. The word translated as deadly in verse 18 occurs nowhere else in the New Testament and the phrase, them that had been with him, occurs nowhere else in the New Testament as a term referring to the disciples. Another interesting fact about the long ending is that it obsessively stresses the importance of believing in Jesus while promising condemnation to those who don't believe. In just the span of 12 verses, the importance of belief and the dire consequences of disbelief are mentioned no less than seven times while in the entire rest of the Gospel, a full 16 chapters, the concept is mentioned just 11 times. An interesting piece of trivia is that the Gospel of Mark in its modern form contains 678 verses. If one were to subtract the longer ending from Mark, verses 9 through 20, or in other words, 12 verses, it would leave 666 verses in the original Gospel of Mark. Although it's often said that 616 was the original number of the beast, it still looks pretty scary, doesn't it? And lastly, it's a well-established fact that later copies of a story, almost without exception, are longer and more detailed. And this is because they get embellished and added to over time, and Mark's story is no exception. With the original Gospel story employing such an unresolved ending and having no appearances by Jesus to anyone after His resurrection, future authors found this ending less than satisfying and set out to write their own, appending their own versions to the existing tale and passing their copy onward. Not only did Matthew likely misunderstand the classic literary techniques Mark was employing but it was common in ancient times for stories to become embellished and grow in both length and detail before being passed on to the next generation of readers who were sometimes authors themselves, who would make new edits and new editions and pass their copy onward. It is common for later copies of a story to be longer and more fleshed out having more details than earlier versions, and the obvious reason is that the original had been added to and embellished with fictional elements at a later time by someone other than the original author. A young lad in Mark turns into an angel in Matthew. A stone already rolled away in Mark becomes one rolled away by the angel accompanied by a great earthquake. The absence of guards at the tomb in Mark becomes an occasion for embellishment by the pen of Matthew, and so on. For these reasons, we can conclude with great confidence that Mark's original story ended at verse 8 and contained no post-resurrection appearances or other details beyond the women finding the empty tomb. It stands to reason, then, that if Mark knew enough details about Jesus' resurrection to write about the women reaching the tomb and actually record verbatim the conversation between them and the young lad in the tomb, he would have certainly included the post-resurrection details we find in other Gospels had he known about them. But allow me to speculate for a moment. What if Mark was not writing a historical account at all? 
Assume just for a moment that Mark was not writing of events that actually happened, but was instead writing fiction, a story about the heavenly Jesus brought down to earth to play the literal role that he played in heaven. What if Mark wanted to end his tale with more of a cliffhanger ending? Did the women ever tell the disciples? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Did Jesus ever meet the disciples again? What happened to Judas? This ending is the type that makes you want to buy the sequel. And sure enough, people started writing the sequel on their own. Since Mark never contained a post-resurrection story beyond verse 8, this calls into question all of the other post-resurrection accounts. There are several reasons for this. First of all, the other Gospels stick closely to Mark's version of the resurrection from verses 1 through 8, often verbatim in places, then diverge widely after that. Next, even if Mark had never acquired embellishment to the resurrection account, the problem of how Matthew and Luke and John could know details that Mark did not know still exists. It's a far-fetched notion that claims that 40 years after Jesus' death, Mark would know intimate details of the women visiting the tomb, but would not have known of details occurring moments after that. Those of Jesus' appearances and sayings Yet, Matthew, writing perhaps even decades after Mark, and copying Mark verbatim in large amounts, would somehow have known about these details. But of course, the simple explanation that Matthew copied Mark and simply altered it to improve upon it from a theological standpoint answers all of the problems we find between the two accounts with one deft stroke. Since Mark could not have penned his gospel any earlier than 70 CE, check out my video series on dating the New Testament to see why this is true. The obvious implication is that there was no tradition at all as late as 40 years after Jesus' death regarding anything that happened beyond the women finding the empty tomb. Surely all of this points to the conclusion that all of the post-resurrection accounts in all four Gospels, including the various endings found in the various manuscripts of Mark, are fictional embellishments to Mark's original story. The very existence of multiple endings to Mark that we find in existing manuscript copies proves that Mark's story was being embellished by many different authors shortly after it began to gain circulation. The idea that people were simply summarizing Matthew's account by removing details such as the earthquake and the Roman soldiers and demoting the angel to a simple lad in white clothing is, shall we say, less than persuasive. It makes sense that by the time Matthew got his copy of Mark, verses 9 through 20, or the longer ending, had not yet been inserted since Matthew's version diverges greatly at that point. Certainly, if it had been in Mark's copy, Matthew would have copied it, just like he did verses 1 through 8 of chapter 16. But Matthew didn't just add details to Mark's gospel, he edited and modified them to create his own improved version. A quick comparison of the speech given by the angel, or boy, depending on which version you prefer, will show beyond any reasonable doubt Matthew's dependence upon Mark's original text. And he said to them, But the angel said to the women, Do not be amazed. Do not be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. You seek Jesus, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. See the place where they laid him. Come see the place where he lay. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, as he told you. There you will see him, lo, I have told you. Can there be any doubt? 
that Matthew was copying the text of Mark's Gospel. Matthew retains many phrases verbatim, but rearranges them and embellishes them as well. Now, one might rightly ask, so what? What if the post-resurrection accounts we find in all four Gospels are merely fictional embellishments to the original Gospel story of Mark? What about the claim in chapter 16 that the tomb was, in fact, empty, and that Jesus had, in fact, risen from the dead? Can we not rely on Mark's claim, since those verses are part of Mark's original writing? In short, no, and there are several reasons why. First, and hopefully obviously, it is foolish to simply rely on someone's claim that something unbelievable happened without also having at least some evidence to support it other than the claim itself. To simply trust an anonymous author's 2,000-year-old claim at face value about an event so unusual as to need a special word to define it, the word miracle, is worse than believing in Santa Claus just because your parents told you. At least you know your parents. No one knows who wrote the Gospel of Mark. But even if we granted that the author was reliably accurate in his account, account being a misnomer, and further, his details are often in conflict with historical and geographical facts, we have nothing better than hearsay, period. We have nothing better than any of the other claims of resurrection offered by all other ancient cultures. We have no hard evidence that there even was an empty tomb, much less that someone came back from the dead and walked out of one. But more about the empty tomb later. In the next several videos, I'm going to explore this wild speculation of mine that Mark was not writing history at all, but was indeed writing a deliberate work of fiction.